We light this candle as a sign of hope. We seek hope in the midst of doubt. We are reminded of the courage of holy people of the past who never lost a sense of hope, even when they faced trauma and turmoil. May we be a people of hope, even in the face of fear. For thousands of years, First Nations people have walked in this land. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives and spirituality. Here on St. Joseph Island, we are gathered on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe of the Ojibwa, Ottawa, and Potawatomi, who are partners with the settler peoples in the Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. And we acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. Good morning and welcome to our online worship service for the 1st of December 2024 and a special welcome to those of you joining us from outside of the St. Joseph Island area. I invite you into a time of prayer. Because of you, fulfiller of promises, we come to know the way to Bethlehem, where justice is born to a shunned family, where the riches of your love are born into poverty. Because of you, sign of our redemption, grace sprouts hope into the winter of our despair. Goodness overcomes evil in the streets of our cities. Love transforms hate in the hardest of hearts. Because of you, negator of our fears. We are taught to pray in the shadows of our worries and to trust that your peace is preferable to those easy prejudices sold on every corner. Because of you, God in community, we will be led into this holy season to the place of our redemption. Raise your heads, children of God, in the bleak midwinter of our lives, our redemption draws near. In the springtime of our doubts, the kingdom of God approaches. Even when we feel most alone, the one who comes to us is the salvation promised so long ago. Thanks be to God, we are forgiven. Amen. Sleep. 
Our scripture this morning continues the apocalyptic literature from the previous two weeks. Our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 36. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among nations confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is offered as God's wisdom for our journey. May we walk in its truth. I was watching a stand-up comedy show on YouTube a few weeks ago featuring an Australian comedian named Greg Champion. The show was in Montreal and in deference to his audience, he sang a song he called the French Song. It's just a collection of familiar but random French words sung with mock seriousness and it was quite funny as he presented it. Pâté escargot, soup de chou, cordon bleu, chic coiffeux, fait accompli maison. That sort of thing. I think we could do another funny song full of weird theological words that nobody understands. Premillennial eschaton. Propitiation, exegetical perichoresis. There you go. The first line is written. So why am I babbling away up here in theologic ease? Just to show you how frightfully clever I am? Well, not really. The $10 words I just rattled off were all in the commentary I consulted this week as I prepared the sermon. Just as a matter of interest, how many of you are confident that you know what premillennial means? It's a term that refers to a particular view about the details of what happens at the end of the world. And if you happen to be into these debates, you can be a premillennialist, or post-millennialist, or even an amillennialist. And it all centers around whether you think that the thousand-year reign of the saints mentioned in the book of Revelation is going to come before or after Jesus returns, or not at all. Personally, I'm an I-haven't-got-the-foggiest-idea-a-list, which I guess technically makes me an amillennialist, which is in keeping with my Roman Catholic roots, the Roman Catholic Church being a millennialist. Each year at the beginning of Advent, rather than the warm, fuzzy Christmas story, which we all want to hear, the lectionary readings bring us these images of the coming end of the world as we know it, and the establishment of the eternal reign of Jesus Christ. In this evocative apocalyptic language, we hear of the moon dripping with blood, the stars falling from the sky, and the Son of Man riding in on a cloud with power and great glory. 
And every year, when faced with that, most of us who don't care much about premillennialism or postmillennialism cringe a bit. You don't have to look too far to see what happens to people that get too caught up in the fervor about the end of the world. Groups like the Heaven's Gate cult with their UFO suicide pact, or the Branch Davidians dying together in a Waco, Texas inferno, make our more fundamentalist brothers and sisters look quite sensible and mainstream. So what do we need to know about the eschaton, the last things, the grand finale of all time? Well, I guess there are only two things that you need to know for sure about it. And these two things seem to be what all the biblical writings about the subject are saying. The first thing you need to know for sure is that it is all in the hands of Christ. And the second thing you need to know for sure about it is that there aren't any more things that you can know for sure about it. That's it, plain and simple. You don't need to know when it's going to be. Jesus said he didn't know himself. You just need to live your life so that you'll be found living faithfully when that day comes. Jesus warns towards the end of the passage against living life in wastedness and weighed down by the worries of this life, for that day could catch you unexpectedly like a trap. If you're dancing to the tune of God's Spirit and the day comes, you'll be found strong of heart, healthy of mind, full of life just as you were created to be. If not, you could be found wasted, shallow, and listless, the life you were gifted with squandered. If you're living life as a gratefully received gift, you'll be found full of integrity, free of greed, anxiety, or compulsion. If not, you are more likely to be found weighed down by the cares of this world, preoccupied with emptying your wallet to find the right accessories to go with your new Christmas outfit or to buy that perfect gift. So you don't need to know when the end is coming. Whether it's tomorrow or a thousand years from now, live today consciously, honestly, simply, mercifully in gratitude for the love you have been given in Christ. The craving to know the details, of course, comes only partly from curiosity, but mostly from insecurity. Having seen so many dreams shattered and hopes come to nothing, we long for confidence about what the future will hold. We want to see the details in advance to inoculate ourselves against further hurts and disappointments. So why does God withhold them from us? It seems a reasonable enough desire. Well, although we might not get the details, God does not withhold grounds for confidence. All you need for confidence in the future is to know the one who holds the future in his hands. Think about it for a moment. My Aunt Sheila, who lives in England, liked to take mystery holidays. It's quite popular in the UK. You show up at the airport, get on the plane, but you have no idea where it's going to land. There's a great deal of uncertainty about their immediate futures. They're about to get into a large tin can, hurtle through the sky, and end up who knows where. But do they lack confidence in the future? Not at all. They're excited and expectant, confident, that they're going to have a good time. The uncertainty about the destination is part of the fun. And they have no fear because they trust that the people who organize these things can operate planes safely and they're not going to drop them off in the middle of a Ukrainian battlefield or leave them in the middle of the tundra with a map and a liter of water to walk home. But how different would it be if the mystery was who was going to fly the plane. If you knew that part of the mystery was that there was only a 50% chance that a qualified pilot 
would actually be on the plane, and even then only a 40% chance that she'd actually be in the cockpit, how many of you would be willing to turn up for a mystery flight then? The gospel is not good news because it predicts a bright, shiny future where all the details are secured in advance and nothing can alter them. The gospel is good news because it promises that the future is in the hands of Jesus Christ, because it promises a future based on the, the faithfulness of God. In Jesus Christ, we have seen the human face of God we have seen the God who will embrace us when we thought we were untouchable. We have seen the God who will heal us when we have given up hope. We have seen the God who will soften our hearts when we had lost faith in our own ability to love. We have seen the God who will point out pathways of peace and reconciliation, even in places as intransigent as Moscow, Tel Aviv or Tehran. We have seen the God who will not let even death have the last say, but breaks free of its clutches, blazing a trail on which all may follow from tragedy to newness of life, full of love and hope. When we hear in the Bible that we will see the Son of Man descending on a thunderous cloud with power and great glory, it need not sound like a threatening image to us because we are the ones who know that the one who comes is the one who has blessed the earth in the past. This glorious, all-powerful Son of Man is also the suffering servant who went to the cross rather than sell out God's love and mercy for us. That is why we are able to live today with confidence and not fear. Not because we know what tomorrow will look like, but because we know that in Christ, God does not give up on the world. Because we know that there is nothing that can happen to us that can separate us from the love of God and nothing that we can do that is beyond the reach of God's mercy. Having come to us as Jesus of Nazareth, God promises to come among us as the great Son of Man, seated on clouds to rule the world. The one who comes on the clouds, that strange, powerful, cosmic Christ, has a face which is none other than the face we will see on a baby at Bethlehem. Thanks be to God. Amen. Ooh. Mm -hmm.
Once again, I invite you to join with me in prayer. O Spirit of hope, when the world is confusing and bleak, you pierce the despair with your word and renew our vision of God's possibilities for our lives. Thank you for lessons learned, for changes of heart and mind, and for new discoveries made and hope restored. As the season turns to winter, We pray for those who feel the burden of loneliness and isolation. We remember those without homes to shelter in and those forced to leave their homes through conflict, natural disaster, or political upheaval. Spirit of hope, shelter all these under your wings. O God of peace, the world and our relationships, homes and workplaces are too much filled with conflict, strife, and disagreement. We pray for places where hurt feelings, violence, and cruelty appear to win the day, and situations closer to home that we carry on our hearts. God of peace, work for just and peaceful resolutions to prevail. O creator of joy, we thank you for moments of joy and celebration in our lives for pleasure given and received, for quiet times of reflection and conversation, and for the many ways that allow us to keep in contact with those we love. We remember those who feel bitter while others rejoice, those who grieve the loss of loved ones, and those who face a bleak winter for any reason. Creator of joy, bring to your people warmth and lightness in the season ahead, and let your joy shine through us as compassionate companions. O love divine, made flesh in Christ, you call us into communion with you and community with one another. We pray for your church and this congregation, that love will guide all your peoples as we plan for our life and mission. We remember before you our families whether we are close or estranged and our friends and colleagues who furnish our lives with love love divine bless each one with your love and help us express our gratitude and concern for each other in word and action and now we join our prayers into one voice and pray in the words jesus taught us to say No! 
May the God of love and justice accompany us. May the Spirit surround us with grace and peace as we walk the way of the Christ. Let all those who do justice and love kindness say Amen. Shalom, everybody. I'll see you next week.